Hey there guys and welcome back. Uh, just gonna go over some of the things I really like about paper card games compared to online card games and things I really hate about paper card games compared to online card games. Maybe like a little view for you guys who might want to get into paper card games so you know what you're getting into exactly because yeah, there's some stuff. Um, we'll go over the cons first. Uh, so <laughs> if this scares you away then you know it's probably not for you but I mean um, of course, one of the big things, cheaters, uh, you gotta really watch out for cheaters. I mean, there's, they come up with some pretty creative ways to cheat in paper card games. I mean, you can sort of, like, you, you want to keep a count on your opponent's hand number and stuff and make sure they're playing their cards right, so that way they don't double draw or something or activate an effect out of turn or something. So that way, yeah, because they'll tire to double draw every now and then. I mean, you catch them on that, they can... He usually loses them around unless the judges are in their favor, which is another problem that we'll get into later. Um, then there's deck sleeves. This this deck sleeves cheating thing is so ridiculous that I don't know if it's around so much anymore because I haven't been to any bigger tournaments for actual paper card games in a while. But they, they'd actually buy like um one of the best deck sleeves to get for paper card games is like Ultra Pros. And they'd buy one set of like the black set and then they get another one that was printed just a little bit later and like you because you can see the print numbers on the packages so you buy like one from 5025 and then you get one from 5030 and the colors will actually be slightly very 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 slightly different um <laughs> you have to pretty much be looking for it and know exactly what you got to be able to spot the difference it's not like obvious but it's just because there's less ink in the machine when it prints out the next set so there's a slight color variation while people will buy the two sets that are close to each other put in their important cards in the slightly different colored ones so they can stack their deck um usually why cutting is really important but it doesn't help so much sometimes because then they know what they're going to draw into uh this is really annoying uh bigger big big tournaments usually have used like their sleeves but not all the tournaments especially not like just local game store tournaments or like tier one or two tournaments usually don't have you use like their game sleeves like you can just use your deck sleeves so i mean they'll check them over for like scratches and stuff but you can't really tell with the deck sleeve trick so yeah cheaters cheaters big problem of course then you got roll sharks which i mean you don't have to worry about so much if you actually know the game that you're playing really well um just kind of annoying because i mean i understand they have like tier one tier two tournaments but at your local tournament where you got like kids playing um yeah there's these roll sharks sometimes are pretty brutal to kids and it's kind of funny because they usually don't ever win but i mean <laughs> they got like they'll make the cards totally fizzle like when i go i want to just play i want to have some fun i want to try to see if the deck works or not and when they're playing somebody like if you pay for a card you're supposed to play the card then pay for it but if you pay for it and then play it they'll just like delete the card they will tell them that they did it wrong and then they'll have the card fizzle uh, i'll usually tell them they did it wrong that you're not supposed to do that and i mean that's such a minor thing that it doesn't really bother me so i usually let it go through because i want to test the deck i'm not there to win it's a two dollar tournament i'm gonna get like two booster packs if i come in first place two or three depending on how many people showed up to the tournament for that night uh, <laughs> so i mean those guys can be pretty annoying um now for the bigger tournaments misinformed judges they suck uh, i actually went to one tournament and i built this for uh, naruto and i built this uh mill deck for naruto that had like this kiba akamaru combo it was this akamaru card i forget which one it was but it was like a jutsu and it, if you had kiba on the field you could mill them and you could like chain it with other things well i'd asked bandai exactly how the card worked and i got the official confirmation i didn't print it out because i hadn't run into this problem before but i got to the tournament i'm facing one of the locals at that game store because you go like really far away to go to the slightly bigger ones um and i'm facing one of the locals and i play the card he says it doesn't work that way we call over the judges and the judges it takes like 10 minutes the judges go over to the their computer and they say oh i just asked one of the people from whatever and you're not allowed to do that and i'm like well let me show you i asked bandai this already on my account i can show you it works this way well 
not allowed to touch their computers for whatever reason, probably because I was facing one of the locals. So for that whole tournament, my whole deck plan was pretty much screwed. That that really, really sucked. And from then on, I just printed out all the rulings on eight cards that were even questionable and problems the tournaments with me. So this, be prepared for something like that. Um, also, cost. Cost for actual paper card games is pretty ridiculous if you want to be competitive. I mean, if you're just going local game store tournaments and trying to have fun, yeah, you can pretty much run anything. I mean, unless you got that one guy who's running, like, tier 1 deck. I would never run tier 1 deck, really, at local tournaments, because it's no fun. I mean, if somebody else is running a tier 1 deck, then yeah, I'll bring out my big boy deck, but <laughs> besides that, there's... It's no fun just raffle stomping people. You're not really getting any experience out of that so i mean yeah the cost cost if you're looking for a meta deck like an relevant meta deck it's gonna run you 400 to 600 400 to 700 bucks uh usually like right now one of the top Yu-Gi-Oh decks is like seven cost you like 700 bucks and one of the reasons is because of ash blossom and joy's spring this card's pretty meta in like every deck and the card itself costs you about 81 bucks right now so and you need three of them, so I mean, <laughs> that's $242 for a playset of one card that you need three of in pretty much every competitive meta deck. Uh, so yeah, that, that gets pretty pricey real quick. Um, but that also opens up like a market, because if you can protect where the meta's going, or you go and get you the ultra rare ultra rare versions because like in Yu-Gi-Oh the root premium is commons and stuff and then people will still pay the big bucks for all ultra rare first edition ones because they want their deck to be shiny I never cared so but you can actually make money off playing the market like that if you get really good at it and you watch the market because you know like oh virus cards are going to be really good and right now some of the virus cards are going ultra rare first edition for like two dollars fifty cents that card becomes popular that's going to shoot up to forty fifty bucks and you can make some decent money that way, but <laughs> I know some people who do that. But yeah, the cost really expensive to stay in the meta. Um, also, you can't play anytime if you're playing paper card games. I mean, now you sort of can because mostly every single paper card game has like an online version or like even like something crappy like YGO Pro or um, the Magic the Gathering dueling system that you can download on your computer and just use all the cards play people that way back when I was playing there wasn't really any of that crap so you couldn't really play anytime and you could only play if <laughs> somebody was by you that wanted to play and that was usually at your local tournament or your friends and then even then if you wanted to play like a meta deck versus a meta deck you got to find somebody else who was willing to shell out that money for an actual meta deck so I mean you kind of get bored of seeing meta decks in the online card games over and over again but you it's if you were trying to prepare to try to be like competitive then it's better to have it that way than not be able to play the meta decks <laughs> at all versus other people um then yeah of course thievery you go to big tournaments you want to watch your cards or even like anything above local tournaments even local tournaments depending on if you know the people or not well enough um, or if you're friends with them all or not, because luckily I was, my local tournaments, I was friends with everybody, so you pretty much didn't have to worry about anybody stealing their crap at the local places, but I mean, you go to regionals or something, you don't have your eye on your binder, your, your deck box says somebody's gonna take them, uh, usually why you don't bring trades there, or you can if you really want to trade, but make sure you're watching that binder all the time, because you let that thing out of your sight for a second, you're gonna lose it, and yeah, that's a lot of money. Um, also, people who don't trade, I don't understand it. You go to these regional tournaments, and you're like, oh, cool, I might be able to trade some people. You got this guy with this cool binder. He's got all these crazy super rares, ultra rares, whatever, and I'm, I don't trade. I don't trade, and I don't sell. Because, I mean, some people will not trade, but they'll actually sell their cards for cash at the places, which isn't so bad. But then you got the people who don't do either, and they just have this binder of really good cards and they're not trading or selling like why did why did you even bring it to <laughs> you just want a chance of your cards to get stolen <laughs> makes no sense but uh next yeah no disenchanting of 
course, you can't disenchant a physical card, so you, if you end up with five super rares of some really crappy ultra rare, then yeah, you got five super rares of really crappy ultra rare that you're probably going to have trouble trading off or anything. And you can't disenchant it to make a really good ultra rare, so... <laughs> There's that. Um, also, cost money to go big tournament, big enough tournaments. Like, I mean, you you play at your locals. Usually, you got a point system. You get points at your locals, then you can go to the next level tournaments. Which for me, are usually like an hour or two away. Then you play at those. You do well enough at those, which you have to pay to go there. You have to pay the entry fee. Some of them didn't have entry fees. Some of them had like a ten dollar entry fee, which you could win decent stuff there. But I mean. Then to get to the next level, which was usually like state, and then the next level after that, of course, worlds. And usually if you beat the state one, like the tier two, tier two tournaments, then you usually get a way to get to the big, big tournament, and you don't have to worry about paying for that. So that's usually how that works. But I mean, as far, you're still showing out a lot just to go to the bigger tournaments. Um, then you got the Reta and Ban list, since it's not a card game. I mean, an online card game, they can't just fix the cards real simply and put in, like, um, what was the recent one? Well, I mean, they also can't just kill the card and make it totally useless all of a sudden, like they did Shield Maidens, uh, <laughs> or Royal Decree, and stuff like that, but I mean, you'll have cards where they don't do what they say they do. You have to make sure there's the Reda list, and you have to check the Reda list in your cards, see if any of the cards that you own are on the Reda list, because they could have a different effect, since the current effect that they had was too broken, and of course they can't just reprint the card that you have in your hand to make it say what it does. I mean, future reprints of the card will say it, but, I mean, the one that you have right then, or if they haven't gotten around to reprinting it yet, will not have the correction on it. So you usually have to bring in a red list with you. And also the ban list kind of sucks, because, I mean, there's sometimes cards that they can't even keep dissimilar, and they just have to straight up ban it. Pretty much everybody knows Pot of Greed from Yu-Gi-Oh! That was banned forever, because it's bonkers drawn two cards, and on a spell card, so it has really high priority. Um... Priority really matters in most other card games, not so much Gwent, because <laughs> there's no, like, chains or anything. Um, so yeah, the ban list sucks, because you can get, like, a really good card. Like, Ash and Joy Springs is really dropping in price right now. It was a $100 card for a while. It's dropping in price because people think it's going to be banned or brought out of the meta soon, since we're getting new set and stuff. So, people are pretty much... Yeah, that's why that one's dropping, because ban list... And if it gets banned, it's not going to be worth crap, because... Except for nostalgia purposes, because you're not going to be able to run into the metas. Nobody really wants it. Uh, but, we'll get into the pros next. Uh, pros? You actually own the cards. That's awesome. Like, I have cards. I can play. Uh, I don't have to worry about servers going down. Um, even Naruto, which isn't even in print anymore, I can I have decks, so that way I can play against my friends. If I wanted to teach them how to play and could play against each other. Which, I mean, I do every now and then, but most of my other friends who still play card games and stuff and already know how to play that because we played that a lot. Um, organizing. This might be a con for most people because, I mean, your cards aren't automatically organized. But I actually enjoy organizing cards. It was really fun separating them. Win, whatever by their elements, or by their attack power, by their rarity, and then monsters, neutral spells, whatever. Um, I find that really fun. Then, trading, of course. Trading. Trading, you can do that with paper cards. You can't trade in most online card games, unless it's something like Hex. But then Hex is asking you to buy booster packs, which are just as much, if not more expensive, than normal card paper card game booster packs, which is why I think the game has such a lower player base. Because you can trade in Hex, but you, why am I going to pay for a game that has, like, no people running that's a knockoff of Magic the Gathering so I can trade? No. <laughs> um, paper card games, though? Yeah, you can trade. You got those crappy ultra rares, you might be able to trade three of them for something decent. Maybe if somebody wanted to play a set of them because they want to make a for, for fun deck or something. My one friend is actually really big into, he has like 
Holy crap, he has so many Yu-Gi-Oh decks. He just collects them and makes like random insect decks and stuff, and he doesn't include most of the meta cards in them, so that way you don't got things like, well, well at the time, Magic Cylinder and Draining Shield and stuff that was pretty much ran in every deck, just because they're really strong, so you don't run things like that, and then you actually have fun with the deck. So training's really cool with actual play paper power card games. Uh, pack opening is really fun. <laughs> I much prefer actually opening up packs of cards over kegs, because it's not as fun. Opening kegs for some reason, I don't know why. I always like opening packs more. And if you buy a booster box of like a card game, you know what you're going to get. It says right on the booster box. Like, yeah, Gwent has a thing where you're guaranteed at least one rare per pack, and you're guaranteed at least one rare per pack in most paper card games, but if you buy a booster box, which is usually like 24 packs, like, then you get like four super rares and an ultra rare in it, guaranteed, so you know what you're getting. Mug granted, a booster box is like 75 bucks, 70 bucks, so <laughs> there's a bit of a price difference there. If you bought 70 bucks worth of Gwent, you'd probably get a lot of golds. Maybe not any. How many packs of kegs does 70 bucks give you? It gives you like 40 or 50, I can't check right now, but I think it's like 40 or 50, so you might not even see a gold actually with 70 bucks in Gwent, now that I think about it. But it's, if you don't, you can disenchant everything and craft gold anyway. Um, also, you can borrow cards if your friends play, or you go like, usually when a big tournament pops up, you go with like your whole local store crew who actually wants to be competitive, and yeah, they have really rare cards, you can borrow some of them, because I didn't always have the really rare cards, <laughs> for sure, and I usually borrowed a lot of cards, and then just returned them at the end, and I ran whatever deck that I felt like running then, because they had, like, every card, so that works out, I mean, you just borrow cards, so that's really cool, but, yeah, overall, I mean, Actually playing the paper card game is a lot different and takes a lot longer because there's no time bar So you have time to think usually there's like chaining and stuff Which is why usually like a Gwen game can last you 10 to 15 20 minutes and then you go and play a paper card game and it's gonna last you a while usually 20 to 45 minutes and It's usually the best two out of three um then Oh yeah, and I guess one more con is how long the tournaments can be. I mean, you go to local, they're usually like two, three hours of playing cards. Uh, but you go to the bigger one after that, and you travel like an hour and a half, two hours away. And you're there for <laughs> like 12 to 18 hours playing cards all day, all day. And your mind starts feeling numb, and then you go two hours back to your place because you don't want to play for a hotel on top of that um so yeah that's that's technically a downside just because it takes so long to get started like they gotta check everybody's deck list they gotta check everybody's deck and like tier one tournaments there's usually like crap ton of people there and yeah that that ends up wearing on you but it can be pretty fun some funny stuff happens uh probably getting some stories about tournaments and stuff that you guys might enjoy but yeah that's just some pros and cons about tournaments that I thought you guys might want to know. I don't know why I did it, but I felt like talking about it, so I did it. There you guys go. If any of you guys listened this far, holy crap, it's, I've been talking about it for like 19 minutes. But yeah, that's about it for this one, guys. I'll see you guys in the next one, and have a good one.